Good morning. I'm glad everyone has been able to join us today. Um, we, uh, I'm Dana Steele. I'm director, I'm director for, for the, the Striving Readers, Readers Grant and the Comprehensive Literacy Grant. Are you all getting feedback? Danielle, are you all able to hear? Yes, I can hear, but it would be great if everyone could mute their mics. Thank you so much. So we're glad that you joined us today. And um, again, I'm Dana Steele from the Kentucky Department of Education and Danielle Ward um, is here as well. And we are both the directors for the um, Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant and the Kentucky Comprehensive Literacy Grant. And we're here today to talk to you about the elevating evidence process. And so I just wanna let you know that we are recording this. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat box and then we will answer those and also answer um, questions that people would like to ask us at the end. Thank you, Dana. Uh, we're going to get started this morning and today's technical assistance is focused on empowered by elevating evidence. We want to point out once again the purpose of the KYCL grant. The purpose of the Kentucky Comprehensive Literacy Grant is to support schools in improving the reading and writing achievement for all learners from birth to grade 12 by providing professional learning for teachers in comprehensive literacy. Specifically, this is a professional learning grant to build teacher capacity in comprehensive literacy. So it's not just a grant about purchasing, you know, programs or technology or software. This grant is focused on professional learning. So what kind of professional learning do you need in your district? You first need to identify your literacy needs. And the first thing you should do is establish a district literacy team. And then use the perks document to identify your district's literacy needs. We have a link there to the perks document. And you can take a look through that document with your district literacy team and figure out what your needs are. Then you're going to develop a district literacy plan to address those needs and then collaborate with approved providers to determine how they can assist you in meeting your needs. And then you're going to reference that in the grant application. Now, here are, are the approved KYCL providers. Please note, all age groups in a district must choose a provider from the approved providers grid. Supplemental providers are in addition to the providers on the grid. So there you'll see at the very top, there are two supplemental providers listed, the National Center for Families Learning, and the contact information for um, that group is Jay Kramer, Josh Kramer at familieslearning.org, and, and then also national board certification. We're getting some feedback. Please make sure your mics are muted. Thank you so much. And then the second supplemental provider is the national board certification uh, process. And you can find out more about that uh, professional learning process at mbpts.org. But the approved providers grid is listed there for you. Early childhood should focus on birth to five. 
And we have ELLP and Imagination Library. Uh, that's with Keith Lyons and his contact information is there. Artful Reading with Roland O'Daniel and he's with CTL. The Governor's Office of Early Childhood. Uh, Amy Neal is the contact there. The Kentucky Writing Project has added a new section for early childhood uh, writing. And so the contact for that is Jean Wolf. And then Head Start is also an early childhood approved provider. For elementary K through fifth, we have the Kentucky Reading Project, Artful Reading, LDC, and Kentucky Writing Project. And then middle high, sixth through twelfth grade, we have the Adolescent Literacy Project, the Adolescent Literacy Model, LDC, the Literacy Design Collaborative, and also Kentucky Writing Project. So there on the approved KYCL providers grid, you see the providers that you must choose from um, for each um, age group. And then the supplemental providers are in addition to. But what if your district has needs that are not addressed on the approved providers grid? If that's the case, you will use the elevating evidence forms when researching strategies, providers, programs, and technology not found on the approved providers grid. These documents should be completed and sent to either uh, Dana or myself for approval before purchases are made. Let me reiterate that. You must have approval before purchases are made. Now, What's the purpose of the elevating evidence documents? Well, the goal is to look at research beyond the vendor provided research. Vendors are going to to spout off all kinds of wonderful things about themselves because they're trying to sell you something. So we want you to look beyond the vendor provided research to ensure that the strategy or the provider, the program or technology that you're interested in is evidence based in elevating comprehensive literacy. So I would like I would like to make sure that it's clear that when you if you are approved for the grant, anytime you're requesting to use some provider that is not on the list, you would send that to Danielle or I for approval. However, you all are applicants for the grant. And so what you will do is send your elevating evidence form, should you decide to fill out any, to the email address on the RFA. It's the KDE RFA email address. That's where all elevating evidence forms will be sent so that you can get prior approval before you ever even submit your application. Thank you, Diana. So let's talk about these elevating evidence documents in more detail. The elevating evidence forms, and you may sometimes see us just refer to it as the EE forms, they should guide your district as you look at a piece of research. However, best practice involves looking at multiple research studies and sources of data to make an informed decision. So here you'll see a link to the Google Doc and we're going to go there in just a minute, but I also want to point out that What Works Clearinghouse is a great place to look for research done by an independent group. Your research would not focus on the vendor, but on the strategies the vendor provides. So let's just take a second and, um, and, and take a look at these elevating evidence documents. Dana, can you still see my screen and has it yes. moved? To the, OK, great. Yes. Awesome. It's so great when technology works. <laughs> All right, so here is um, the elevating evidence empowered by evidence document. Um, this is not something that the KYCL grant uh, came up with. This is what is recommended um, by the Department of Education for reviewing evidence under the, the uh, ESSA. 
So it gives you some introduction here in the beginning about, um, you know, ESSA. And one of the requirements is that school improvement initiatives be rooted in evidence based activities, strategies or interventions. And so that's what we want to make sure that if you are asking for approval for a particular program or um, software or professional learning that is not on that approved providers grid, that it is evidence based. Um, activities, strategies or interventions in comprehensive literacy. So this just gives you the, the first part of the elevating evidence forms just gives you basic information about the instrument. Um, it gives you some webinars. You could also access um, different levels, a glossary of terms um, while you're researching. But this second page is where you'll begin to insert um, your information. Um, you're looking for a, a study, a research study, evaluation of a particular program. Um, and so you'll look at what kind of study design it used and and so on and so forth. So as you see, um, this this can be very involved. And so if you choose someone um, that's not on the approved providers grid, you're really going to have to do your research and be able to prove that it is an evidence based program uh, that will increase achievement in comprehensive literacy. OK, so there there are several things that you're going to have to answer there. I'm going to click off that. OK. And then what works clearinghouse? Dana, can you see the PowerPoint once again? Yes, I can. I can see awesome. it. Awesome. OK, so what works clearinghouse is a great place to look for research. Um, and so let's go there for just a second so that you can just see what that looks like as well. If you've never used what works clearinghouse before. Um, you can select topics to find what works based on the evidence, and it's very um, self-explanatory. Here's literacy. You can click there and find research um, that will help you um, to prove that the program you're interested in um, will help literacy achievement in your district. Or what you may find is that the program you're interested in won't um, do that then you wouldn't want to purchase that. So it's just great information for you to make an informed decision about the programs, the strategies, the professional learning that you're interested in. OK, next. Along with that empowering uh, evidence document, we also ask for you to respond to these guiding questions for elevating evidence research. You're going to respond to these guiding questions as you research literacy strategies from vendors, programs or technology not on the approved providers grid. And then you'll submit the responses to these questions with the EE forms to this um, email address as Dana had pointed out earlier. This is before you make any purchases because you will have to get approval first to the KDE KYCL at education.ky.gov email address. But let's just take a look at some of these guiding questions. For instance, what is the name of the professional learning provider or resource, your resource you are requesting? Um, something we want to point out is that this may be in addition to the research. For example, you may be researching the use of structured literacy strategies. However, the professional learning provider you are requesting is the special education cooperative who is providing training in structured literacy strategies. Um, how does the professional learning provider or research or pardon me, resource match the intent of the grant. And remember, the intent of this grant is professional learning to build teacher capacity in comprehensive literacy. How does the requested professional learning provider or research resource support the district and school literacy plan? 
How will the professional learning providers support teachers by providing the training and support needed to change teacher practice? How will the resource support the goal of creating a robust literacy environment for students? And that includes a balanced literacy assessment plan. Will the resource be a one time purchase? And if not, how are you planning on sustaining the initiative? And then what percentage of KYCL grant funds are going to be used to purchase? And remember, if you're looking to purchase technology, only 2% of the grant funds after you've taken out um, grant uh, managers or uh, literacy coaches um, pay is allowed to be used for, for technology, only 2%. Dana, do you have anything to add there? No, that's exactly right. And this grant, you're gonna, you can pay um, salary, a portion of a salary for only one person. And as a reminder, it can be a grant manager who you pay 30% of salary through the grant, or it could be a grant manager slash literacy coach, and you're allowed to pay 50% of their salary with the grant. Um, you have to choose one of those, and when you choose that, that person will need to work that percentage of time that they're paid for the grant. So you would take the total amount of your grant award, and you would subtract the salary that you have decided to use in your district, and then with whatever is left, 2% of that can be spent on technology. Again, we want to remind you that this isn't a grant to get technology. This is a grant for professional learning. And so if you did choose to use any type of technology, you would have to submit an approval um, request and explain why the technology um, is needed and how it's going to support professional learning in your district. OK, so that's really all the information we have today about elevating evidence documents or the approval process. If you're looking for something outside the approved providers grid. Um, so now Dana and I can take questions uh, that you may have about elevating evidence documents, the approval process or the KYCL grant. You will find those forms at the at the KDE Competitive Grants website. You will you'll be able to see those forms. They're already there for you to take a look at. So when someone asks when they will hear back, when you fill out the forms, you have they have to be received in that KDE RFP at education.ky.gov mailbox by Friday, November 6th to be considered. And then you will hear back by November 27th and whoever emails the um, elevating evidence forms will be the person who is um, sent the email about whether that will be approved or not. Um, someone asked if you submit earlier, do you hear earlier, or is everyone notified at the same time? Um, you could possibly be, um, uh, be um, alerted earlier. Um, it's just going to be a however, however long those take to process, and that depends on how many we receive and at what periods of time. And so there is a possibility that you would know earlier. Our goal is to give you the information as quickly as possible because we want you to be able to use whatever um, is approved in your plans that you would submit in your application. So we would let you know just as quickly as we can, but I, I, I'm not promising it would be before 20, November 27th, um, but it will be um, at, at least by the 27th you will hear something. Um, Jennifer Bryant, um, would you the address um, someone thinks that or says that the address is different on the slide than it is in the chat box. Um, Jennifer Bryant is going to put it again in the chat box. That's the one that you would use. That's the KDE RFP mailbox that you would use. Yes, uh, you will follow the directions in the RFA, which is the KDE 
-E -R -F -P at education.ky.gov. And yes, I also noticed the slide had a different uh, email address, but always um, follow the RFA when you're uncertain or ask us a question. We ha we're happy to answer questions. I bet that email address was the email address you would use once you've been awarded the grant. Yes. All right, we have another question. It says, are all districts required to select a provider from the provider list or can we use only providers approved through the elevating evidence? So um, you are going to have to have a provider for every level. You're going to have to have one for early, at least one for early, at least one for elementary, at least one for middle high. And so it does have to be an approved provider. So it could be one of two things. You can you can either choose them off the already approved provider list and you don't have to do anything more. You don't have to submit anything more for that. Or you can ask to use a different professional learning provider and you can receive approval for that. So it, it might look like a, a variety of things in your district. For example, you may choose someone off the provider list for early and maybe you've asked to select something um, different for elementary. You might use um, a provider that has been approved through the elevating element elevating evidence process through elementary and then you might pick someone off the grid for middle and high so it can it can be a combination but in the end um, for every single level early and that's up to a birth to age five and then elementary and middle and high you will have to use a per, um, provider that is pre-approved does that answer your question, Brian? OK, so someone someone. OK, great, Brian, I'm glad that it did. Someone has asked about if you are a continuation application. If you're a continuation, that means that you are currently, you, your district currently has a Striving Readers Comprehensive Literacy Grant. And when you're applying, you are going, your application will look different than if you're a brand new district that does not have a Striving Readers Grant. And the question that is being asked is, if you are required to complete 70 hours of professional development, if you if you go to um, and Shannon, please um, clarify if I'm not understanding your question. If you decide to go with a new professional learning provider, someone who you did not use in circle, that could be someone who is on that grid, but you did not use them. For example, you might have had a strong focus in reading in elementary and now on top of continuing reading, you also want to spend more time on writing and you want to now have your teachers go to the Kentucky Writing Project. You will the teachers again will need to go through that cohort model for anything new and yes, 70 hours is required for the first year of professional learning. The continuation 30 hours that you mentioned, if you are right now working with LDC and you have a plan with them to continue your professional learning for the next um, three years with them, then you would fall in, go into that 30 hours rather than 70 per year because you have already had extensive training with LDC. So let me say that in a different way. If you are using any professional learning provider that is new, you will again need to get the 70 hours and fall back into that cohort model of professional learning. If you are continuing anything you've already started in circle, then you will follow the continuation plan that is outlined in the RFA um, and in that matrix of hours. Um, someone else had a question. Can we separate elementary into primary and intermediate? Absolutely. Yes, you can do that. 
you are you may use um, the you may select the providers and and you are um, the goal is for you to select the providers based on the needs of your teachers and your students in your district. So that makes it even trickier when you're trying to find um, professional learning uh, providers, resources, programs. You want to make sure that the research says that they've been shown to work with that population um, that matches your population and matches your needs. So yes, you can absolutely have more. You will be used, the way this grant works is you are given an amount to spend each year and you may use that money for professional learning in the way that meets your needs and you have to use a per, uh, approved providers, but it doesn't mean that you have to use just one per level. You can use any of those that meet your needs. And you pay for those with the grant funds that you're awarded. So it'd be when you're thinking about your provider, one of the things that's really important is to take time and to go ahead and call the call who you think you might want to use and talk through plans. That way, when you're writing your application, you can give very specific plans on how you plan to use that professional learning and it, implement it um, and sustain what you're doing in your district. You'll have a better understanding if you've really talked to the professional learning providers and you know exactly what they provide. Please guard against someone um, contacting you and um, indicating that they are an only choice of a provider like someone had before we got the meeting started. There are multiple choices and you do have um, the opportunity to pick one that meets your needs. And so if someone contacts you, please keep that in mind. The RFA clearly lays out the choices. And so if you have any um, questions about anything, go back to the RFA and look in the RFA to make sure that you know who the choices are. Jennifer, so, I wanna, some, oh, oh, sorry, Dana. Sorry, Dana. Go ahead, no, it's go. okay. Someone asked about the estimate on the number of grants that will be awarded in round two, and the estimate of grants is going. The estimate is going to be about fifteen, and but that depends on who applies because a different amount of money is given if you're small than if you're medium, um, and then if you're large. So because of that, it depends on who gets the highest scores how big their district is, and then we go down from there to give the awards. But we're uh, estimating that it will be about 15 grants awarded in KYCL round two, what you're applying for right now. You're welcome, Liz. Does anyone have any other questions they might want to ask? Remember that this elevating evidence packet is due November 6. That's something to keep in mind. Any that are turned in after November 6 will not be considered as a part of the application. If you were a district that is awarded, you would have the opportunity to apply for additional professional learning providers, resources, programs after the award. But as far as getting information before you ever fill in an application, we have to have those by November 6. So keep that in mind. So someone asked if they need to have 70 hours of professional learning if they are they're a continuation district and they're going to keep their current provider, but they want to add a supplemental provider like national boards. So Amy, the question for the answer for that is you if you are continuation and you continue your provider, you will follow the grid for continuation districts in the RFA that states that you will get third that every teacher 100% of teachers will get 
30 hours um, for the third first two years and 24 for the third year of professional learning. National boards do not um, they are supplemental and they're just added in and so they do not apply to the cohort model. National boards can be paid for with KYCL funds and you can um, you can pay for that for any teacher in your district who wants to be a part of national boards, but that is separate from the cohort model of ours. Please keep in mind, though, that the, the whole reason that professional learning hours are there are a lot of them is because this grant is supposed to give teachers an extended focus on literacy for an extended period of time to really change practice. So the goal isn't just to dip into professional learning here and there and get a few tidbits here and there. The goal is to really focus on changing your teacher practice and literacy. And that's why the grant is written the way it is. And if you keep that in mind when you're thinking about your plan, I think it'll help you to form a really solid plan um, for your district. So if a circle district applies, um, you are going to be continuation, no matter what your continuation. Someone asked if a circle district selects a new provider, they're going to apply as a new applicant. And um, the answer is no. If you are circle at all, you are going to apply as a continuation district and there's going to be questions throughout the RFA that you will need to answer very clearly based on what you're doing in circle and how your continued involvement with the striving readers grant is going to um, continue the work you started and um, add to that. So if you're circle, no matter who you choose for a provider, you are continuation district. However, when you start talking about what your professional learning is going to look like, that's when it gets a little different. Because if you're, um, and when you look in the RFA, you'll see there is, a, there is a section for new and then there's a section for continuation. And in continuation, there is, there's a model on the grid for professional learning hours that shows what do you do if you're going to go with somebody new? And what do you do if you're going to continue with who you have? But you will still be applying as a continuation district and you will still be answering and should answer questions throughout um, in the RFA. At the end of the RFA, there's an, a section that ha gives you that tells you how many points you will be given and it gives you really specific questions that you need to answer in order to get the, those points for the score. And it would be very important for you to answer those as a continuation district if you've already been circle. Cherry, did that answer your question? You're welcome. We want to also remind you that we will be doing um, question and answer sessions. Um, one of them will be November 4th from 1 to 2. And then the next will be November 5th, the next day, but it'll be 10 to 11. Those are open formats, just like we're having right now. You can ask questions about anything related to the grant. If you do not attend one of the technical assistance sessions to ask questions, then your other option is to send questions to the KDE RFP education.ky.gov mailbox and um, you can get an answer to your questions through that.
So that's all that we are going to share today, but we are going to um, stay on. Danielle and I are going to stay on for a little bit in case um, anyone has another question. It looks like I see one right now. It says. Um, no, the answer is no, Shannon, if you are. Um, Shannon is asking a question. She's a circle district and they're they're using uh, something that's been approved for with some supplemental they have and they're asking if they can use them as a vendor, but they're not on the list. And the answer is no. Shannon, if it is if it is not if a provider is not on that provider list approved provider list right now for KYCL then you do have to fill out an elevating evidence form to get approval to use them in KYCL as your main provider. They absolutely can be part of a continuation plan, yes. You can use them. However, um, they would need to be approved if they're going to be your um, if you're going to use KYCL money to pay for their services, their professional learning services in KYCL, you do need to fill out an elevating evidence form to be able to use them. That is what the elevating evidence is new to KYCL. It was not used in Circle. We had a different um, way that people got approval if they wanted to use something even in addition of something. But in KYCL, if you want to use any professional learning providers, programs, resources, you will have to fill out that elevating evidence packet to get approval at any point of the grant. It look, there are several pages in that elevating evidence, but once you really look at it, I think you'll um, you'll understand it and I don't think it's going to be difficult for you to fill out. It's very um, it explains every part of it and has some good resources. The whole goal, as Danielle said, is to get you to really look at the evidence supporting what you want to um, have in your literacy plan for your teachers. And like I said, you really need to guard yourself and really look at things with a careful eye because when a state grant comes out with a lot of money attached to it, a lot of vendors start sending information and some of them say they are approved and but if they are not on our RFA, they are not approved. Some of them are when they're when they're saying they're approved, that means they're not they're not trying to be deceptive. I don't think always they are. Some of them maybe are approved in different states because this KYCL grant is a federal grant. And so there are many states that have the federal grant and they may be an approved provider in a different state. But if they are not on the RFA for KYCL, they are not already approved for Kentucky. So be careful with that. Um, we've had that um, happen in the past that people have said that they're approved and they may be approved in a different state, but not Kentucky. So if you so the question is that um, if you are using CTL as a main provider and they are on the approved um, provider list, but you plan to use other multiple other vendors in combination, then what you would do is you would not have to fill out an elevating evidence packet for CTL because they are already approved. However, if there are other vendors that you want to use in combination with CTL, you would have to fill out an elevating evidence packet for them. Any professional learning provider, resource, 
um, or program that is not approved, that does not show that it's already approved on the RFA, you have to fill out the elevating evidence forms for, both before you submit the application and throughout the life of KYCL. That's going to be the process for adding in any additional um, professional learning providers and resources with the goal of really taking time with your team to look at the research on what is most beneficial to your um, to your students and your teachers and what will really meet your needs. So if you if you will look at the provider grid, CTL Artful Reading is already on the lid uh, on the grid uh, for KYCL for early and elementary. And so anything that is on the already uh, approved provider grid, you do not have to fill out an elevating evidence packet for. So the Kentucky Writing Project for Early Childhood is on, is going to be, um, it is included. Um, the, this question is asking about the Kentucky Writing Project Early Childhood Kids Writing Academy. On the PowerPoint that Danielle showed, showed earlier, it is listed. Um, what Cherry is referencing is on the RFA, when you look for early, early does not list Kentucky Writing Project for early childhood. However, that Kids Writing Academy. However, when we did our um, information, the two day information that um, that we did on the 14th and the 15th of October, we gave you links to vid um, vendor videos um, that explained their programs. And one of those was the Kentucky Writing um, Project for Early Childhood, that Kids Writing Academy. It is Kentucky Writing Project was already an approved provider, uh, approved professional uh, provider, professional learning provider. And so the Kids Writing Academy is approved and you do not need to fill out an elevating evidence packet for that. You will see that in the slide deck for the PowerPoint um, that Danielle just talked about. Thank you for asking that, Terry. That was um, I want to make sure that we clarify that Kentucky Writing Project was already an approved provider on the approved grid. They just haven't they just have a new program for early childhood that. Has been added. You're welcome. One of the things you want to keep in mind when you're filling out your after you fill out your perks document, you think about your needs is really keeping in mind the full um, scope of compre comprehensive literacy and how what how your programs are really going to meet every part of that. You can't have a strong literacy program if you only focus on writing or if you only focus on phonics or if you only focus on um, reading to have a strong comprehensive literacy program. You need to focus on all of the aspects of literacy. And so if you keep that in mind when you're thinking about um, what you're wanting to use, um, that'll help you as well. 
And that definition of comprehensive literacy is in the RFA. And it breaks down all the components of comprehensive literacy that are important to address when you're crafting a, um, a strong literacy program for your district and your schools. So someone just asked, what about teachers attending conferences specific to literacy? Do we need to complete the EE forms for them? If it is a conference that focuses on literacy, then you would send an email. Now we're talking about once we're once you're awarded, once you are awarded, if your district is awarded, if you want to attend a literacy a conference, then you would have to um, send an email to Danielle Ward or me, Dan Dana Steele, and we would work together and approve those and let you know you would not need to fill out that elevating evidence form for conferences. I do want to make a note about conferences. No out of state conferences are allowed. It is only in state conferences and it would be conferences that are very that are specific to literacy. So I want to make sure that I um, let you know that up front. In your application, if you want to mention a conference and how it would um, work with your program, you can. I don't know that it would get you any more points to mention anything related to going to a conference. However, if you wanted to put that and if you want to make sure that you put that in your budget, if you do put it in your any budget template, that you would have to very you would have to really uh, explain um, why they would be going, um, who, how many people would be going, where would they be going, um, for what purpose, and um, you can put that in your budget. Um, I'm I don't feel like that's going to give you any more points on your application when the reviewers score it. But if that's something that you want to go ahead and put in, you can. One thing I'll let you know is that if you're awarded your literacy plans and your budgets that you submitted are not final. So if you are awarded this grant, you will meet with Danielle and I and we will go through your literacy plan very carefully. We will go through your budget with you very carefully to form the it final plan that will be implemented. So just because you submit a plan doesn't mean that that's what the plan is going to be and that you would have to stick to it. Just because you submit that budget doesn't mean you're going to have to completely stick to it. However, you on your application, you want to do make the best um, choices thinking about the intent of the grant being professional learning, make the best plan you can um, with the focus of the grant in mind. And then once you're awarded, we would work with you and really make sure that everything aligns to the intent of the grant. You're welcome. When you are filling out the elevating evidence, anything that you are afraid that someone reading it for approval would not understand, just be as specific as you can. It's better to give more information than less information. Okay, do we have any, have any questions, 
Well, if well, not, uh, Dana and I are going to stay on uh, the the um, the recording for a little bit longer, just in case you do have some questions. Remember, you can also send questions to the KDE RFP at education.ky.gov email address. Um, and we thank you for participating with us today. Um, we will have uh, the PowerPoint for this posted um, a little bit later on the competitive grants page. Um, but thank you so much. Um, and we'll we'll stay on the line for a little bit longer just in case you think of something. You guys have a great day. Thank you guys. You're welcome to join us on November 4th and and answers. Dana, I'll go back in and take all the questions from this particular uh, meeting and add them to uh, the list of questions that we already had accumulated from the other TA session. Thank you, Danielle. I'm going to stop the recording now. Okay.